from each one of you to all our distinguished global retail and real estate leaders where today as we discuss the new retail code focusing on customer experience mixed use development experiential retail community building sustainability and technology advancement let me tell you that mapping india 2024 will provide insight and of course strategic to help industry stakeholders excel in this evolving environment we have as i already mentioned the best of the best panelists who will be joining us as speakers keynote address given by one of the best so let's bring in together with more energy i get this that we are starting this post lunch so some of you are still in that good mood of that food that you just had but let's pump up with some more energy and can we start the conference with a round of applause please for ourselves all right lovely so the first topic the first panel is it's a very interesting one and me myself is also excited to hear out we have as i already mentioned the best joining us at the panel the topic is bridging the gap between digital and physical shopping experience we all know both have its own benefits to know more let's call out the best please join me as i invite on stage our moderator for this session jadeep shetty consulting partner green honchos to please join me on stage Moving ahead, please join me as I welcome on stage my panelists. We have our next Abhishek Raj, COO, Lakast India. A huge round of applause, keeping up the energy, ladies and gentlemen. Come on, Narendra Pratap Singh, Director, Samsonite. Shailendra Singh, Business Head, SVP, Nike Beauty. Sunil Menon, Chief Expansion Officer, Lenskart. Come on come on where's the energy everybody Devesh Sinha director digital commerce Pepe Jeans India and next we have Vidyut Panjdeo chief business officer brand FMCG fashion retail ethnics Raymond Well a very good evening to each one of you thank you so much for joining us and gracing this occasion Taking all the notes backstage, sir. Over to you. Hi, girl. Thank you. Hi, good evening, uh, and uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for taking out time to uh, uh, give us some insights into your business. Uh, I'll start off by asking you. Uh, If you have to describe your job to a ten-year-old kid, how would you? What would you describe it as? I mean, we know your organizations, we know your designations, but what is it that you do? Vidyu, do you want to take it first? Yeah, no, that's okay. Let Vidyu start. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Vidyu Banjdeo. I manage a new brand in the Raymond family called Ethnics by Raymond. which is men's ethnic wear and i'm responsible for scaling up this brand in the country we currently have around 120 stores and we aspire to go to around 400 stores in the next 2 to 3 years dev <clears throat> hello uh, thanks jaydi first of all it's a pleasure to be here with this league of gentlemen uh, and if i were to describe what i do i look after the digital commerce business for pepe that means everything that's got to do with online sales the online part of business and online today contributes to roughly more than 25% of our overall business and is the fastest growing so yeah i am sunil menon a chief expansion officer since jaydeep said for a 10 year old what do i say i tell him that i will open stores next to your house so that you can wear your specs once you grow up because it's not for him because 10 year old we don't do the kids now so that's how it is i manage the complete expansion globally and uh, we have about 2000 stores in india and around 70 stores globally in southeast asia and middle east and that's what i do es establish retail spaces across globe thank you 
Hi, uh, I'm Shell, uh, Shailendra Singh. I head the physical retail business for Nika, uh, managing the end-to-end -end, uh, business for Nika. Uh, and to a 10-year-old, my uh, simple uh, explanation would be that uh, there's a store where your mama goes and ends up spending about an hour and lots of money of your daddy or herself, uh, and, and I'm responsible for that store. So that's, that's me. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm uh, N.P. Singh. I started the first tour for Samsonite in India and continuing to with the same, same, same work, uh, not yet bored because I have started in India and taken the retail expansion to Southwest Asia as well. Uh, it has been doing well for us since we started the retail. Now today we have a different session which is going to compare us from the physical, physical to digital uh, which we would like to explore through. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Abhishek. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Brand Lacoste in India. <coughs> we are a 94-year-old uh, brand and to a 10-year-old uh, kid, uh, we are the ones uh, who actually make, run and operate the shop from where you buy your favourite crocodile polo. Uh, that's what it is and we are currently operating about 63 point of sale here in India. It includes both online and offline. And uh, we are here to stay and we are continue to have more and more uh, within this country. Thank you. Okay, now uh, uh, give me some insight into your own businesses. Uh, you know, there's been a first wave of uh, digital uh, commerce where, uh, you know, we all ran physical stores and we said, you know, 8% should come out of e-commerce, 15% should come out of e-commerce. But today that has changed and uh, especially post-COVID, I think there's been a big difference in the way consumers shop. Tell me about your own organization. How have things changed in terms of structure, the business operation, the team that manages, the targets, the budgets? Because, uh, you know, today I think it's become seamless. People are buying the brand. It's not about online and offline. It's about being Pepe, buying Pepe, Samsonite, Lacoste. Nika, you know, so that entire thing is blurring. How has it impacted your organization? Uh, Abhishek, this time I think you might want to take it first. Uh, uh, thanks. So I'll, I'll tell you a very interesting fact. As in 2012-13 uh, in uh, time when we used to go to these events, it was online or offline, who's going to stay, who's, you know, offline will not be uh, the future and so and so forth. Now it's completely different. Uh, people used to say that people come to your store, try, and then they buy online. This is what we used to heard a lot. Now, we have a different uh, approach. People do all the research about you online, then come to your store, try, and then buy in your store. This is completely reverse of what we used to uh, talk about, that people are buying. One of the most important thing for this is, they always check what is your price in offline and online. If you are able to manage this well, then chances are that they will experience your product in your store and they will end up buying in your store. Because the moment you like something, you want to have it, you want to own it. Then you don't want to wait some guy to come and deliver it in three days time. So this is the biggest change in the trend that we are seeing, especially in Metro, where we have both offline and online presence available. The other thing that we, we have started seeing, and this is the one trend uh, which we see now, that uh, most part of the India has started consuming premium products as well. So if we talk about 28 states and 8 union territories in India, at least 3 to 4 percent of each state and union territories are now consuming premium products as well, which is a great insight for everyone because it was a misnomer right from beginning that only metros and mini metros are the one where premium products can be sold. But with the reach that you have through e-commerce, I think this is another change that we have started experiencing at least for us. And the third thing, again, this is a debate between India and Bharat. Now Bharat is also consuming. The only difference is India is consuming at full price and Bharat is consuming it at a discounted price. But aspiration is there, and that is another shift that we see in, in the overall uh, scheme of things. Thank you. 
In our case, we have got a complete segregation of the approach towards our customers. The Samsonite brand, if you buy from the store or online, uh, there's only a difference of uh, convenience. Maybe if you're in a hurry to buy something, you're very clear about the product sure. and the price, you just end up buying it online and uh, just go ahead with it. And if you visit the store, the same price, same product, uh, rather it helps you to decide better in terms of the size, the content and the comparison as well. So therefore, we don't have any fight between the online and offline. It's very clear-cut message to customers and for the customer respect that because we, may, we will we, uh, build a very good product at a whatever reasonable price. We will say reasonable but people might say it's expensive. But globally, if you compare the price of Samsonite, then it will be about 20-25% to 30% cheaper than the Europe. So we'll compare with that because our price point starts with that kind of a comparison because the brand, you know, it has started the business from that part of the world. So therefore there's no fight between the uh, physical and digital. Whereas our another brand called American Tourista, there we do have uh, online presence which is strong presence in comparison to many other brands in that price segment. And therefore you have to play the game as per what is going on online. So there is a discounting happening at American Tourista, uh, which is a, uh, 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 you can see the same price what you find otherwise at the department store. You will find the similar price at the uh, online. So you will not have something which is cheaper than what you can find at the department store. So therefore, there is again no two kind of pricing we play where we are doing some kind of a discount. So there again, there is a kind of a uniformity we, we maintain. And therefore, we do have uh, uh, representation in the digital world and we do have our physical world managed, segregated very separately, very, very well and expanding every year with number of stores what we desire and doing our business very, very differently. There is no fight between both the world. So that's what we are doing in our Thanks, NP. Yep. Uh, at Nika, what we are seeing is that consumers today truly are omni-channel. When we open a new store, we see that eight, seven to eight out of ten customers who are walking in have shopped online as well, right? So, uh, but at the same time, what I would want to call out is the processes which are there for online versus offline are very, very different. And I think the structure, hence at our side, we've created two separate teams. Of course, there will be a common agenda, common activations, which we make sure is seamlessly managed. But I do not think it is about merging the two teams. Each of the channels require their own fundamental processes and uh, systems to be set up. And that's how kind of we've structured it. Um, and of course, there's a journey when we started early. And in our case, it's the inverse of perhaps what other gentlemen here have done where it was physical first and online later. For us, it was online first and physical later. So brand management, for instance, was part of the same team. and It was omni-channel. But now when we see the channel, physical channel in itself being large enough, is where all those teams have been segregated. So I think that's the process each of the organizations follow, where they start by leveraging the current infrastructure. But as the channels develop, you feel the need, and there is a certain need to really create specialists within each while making sure they are combined at the right uh, agenda points. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll keep it a little short. Uh, basically, like what uh, Shailen was saying, we also started as an online yeah. company. Yeah. So Lenscard was online for almost two years. It was purely online. And we, as a trial, started our offline business. And today, if you ask me, 10% of the business is online. 90% of the business is offline because of the retail space which is available. So that's a big shift. And we did not have only retail stores. We had HTO, Home Tryon. We had online our own website. Now we have market space. We have assisted sales which is another channel which is available. And we have also WhatsApp sales, social media sales or e-commerce, whatever it is. Plus now we also have quick commerce. So we have e-com, we have quick-com, we have HTO, we have assisted sales, we have online business, we have offline business. But remember one thing, that for everything the customer is same. Customer is visiting each channel 
but we have one customer visiting multiple channels if required. Getting this data together is extremely important, right? Mapping the customer journey is extremely important in this case. So we have built our silos in each digital, but when it comes to customer, we have one customer. So we have integrated that particular CDPs at that level. As a result, we will be able to give personalized digital marketing advantage or digital services to these guys. So that's the only difference which I think will be more important for us as we move forward. Dave, uh, just adding on to what was being said, so that couple of things that we are doing at Pepe, a couple of things that we are doing at Pepe, so we are investing in technology and when we say investing in technology, not just from the digital side of things, but also in our traditional offline business. What that means is we are integrating our backend. So the same OMS, the WMS speaks the same language, be it whatever the channel up front. We are looking at um, you know, a consolidated data pool. That means whatever the consumers, whatever the channel, you know, at backend we can look at it, we can create journeys, we can even build AI on it. So it, be it CRM, be it uh, chatbots, be, be it personalization, all of that could be one harmonious uh, database and we are investing in people because talent is very important and it requires a different mindset so we are looking at very different functions when it comes to digital so data analytics plays a big role marketing is very different it's very data driven so performance marketing is something that we really going that requires very different skill sets uh, we are also looking at automation in terms of reporting uh, so and also tech so while you know you can you can have third party vendors supplying you all this, there needs to be in-house talent to manage this and grow this. So that's where we are also investing in. Uh, sort of, uh, I'll just take us back to COVID. So when COVID hit us, uh, I think very few brands were prepared with this online model, right? And that was the only channel which was working. So obviously everybody jumped into the fray and we also jumped into the fray. Um, marketplaces were there, they were working well, but then discounting was very high. And over a period of time, we realized that as the market started opening up, this channel has evolved quite a bit. And the consumer who's shopping online has a very different behavior pattern as compared to somebody who's shopping offline. Therefore, the entire promotion, marketing strategies and targeting the segmenting these consumers has to be very different than what we do for offline space. So it, in our company, we have actually created a separate vertical where we are investing in technology, we invested in systems, processes, and we invested in talent, which means we have got people who are experts, people who understand the digital landscape, understand the behavior, buying behavior of the consumer, how the consumer flirts with different brands. And also we have taken control of the pricing of our product. Um, it was left to the marketplace player earlier. Uh, that's an easier job, but it kills your brand is what we realized. So now the entire pricing control is with us. So therefore that helps us in sort of making sure that our online, offline, there's some amount of parity in pricing. Uh, the other thing which we do is we do a lot of performance marketing today, which helps us drive sales through uh, ROS in, in those websites. So that's something which is again a very different kind of a talent required for that. And we've actually hired this kind of people to do it for us. And the last thing that we do is uh, there is a certain expectation of the customer who's shopping online. So we create certain products which are uh, specifically available only on digital uh, platforms. Uh, so, and that's not available in the physical uh, space because there is a price segmentation which is clearly visible uh, in the online space. So to cater to that customer, we create specific products for that. So those are the three, four things that we've done differently between then and now to make sure that this channel really grows faster. So Bidyut, uh, you uh, spoke about uh, pricing parity and it's a question I have uh, with the other panelists as well. You know, one of the biggest uh, dissonance that happens is uh, when, you are, when you go into a showroom of a brand and then you find that the same product is available cheaper online. Okay, there's a very popular sports brand and the shoes online you always get a 15% discount, first time discount. You can keep giving a new email uh, and you can get it. So I never go into that showroom ever and buy. Uh, now, how do you manage this across? Because 
you know, brands like Pepe are probably sold out of 400, 500 points. There are marketplaces, your own uh, website. So how do you manage to keep this pricing parity across all channels? And I'm, this is a question to all panelists, even for Lenskart, Nika, you know, how do you manage to do this? So, yeah, it was a dissonance earlier for the consumer because, uh, see, a lot of, uh, I mean, e-com earlier was also treated as a liquidation channel. So, therefore, a lot of OSM used to go into this channel. And when you sell OSM, you obviously give it at a discount. It's equivalent to your factory outlet. Now, what we have done now is when you go into our fresh stores, we make sure that if there is some product which is a carry forward of previous season, and, and that is not discounted in the store, we make sure it's not discounted in the e-com website also. Which is why I mentioned earlier that we have taken control over the pricing ourselves. Earlier, this used to be left to the uh, website certain times, the marketplace uh, player to make sure whatever, and they have their own ticket size discounts also, we sometimes come and sit on your product. So you stopped all of that. So therefore, there is no way you can go to a e-com website and see a pricing of a product which is lower than what is available in the stores. We also do a lot of uh, uh, listing of our e EBO stocks in the marketplace and therefore whatever is available at the EBO, the same price is, is it's listed at the website. And uh, it's very rarely nowadays we see that somebody has come into a store and said that, hey, you know, this is what I got in the website and in your store it's at full price. So therefore, merchandise management, in what is in store and we, we have multiple formats. So we have the Raymond shop, the MBOs which are outright formats. So we have to be very careful about what kind of inventory they are carrying and therefore what are we discounting in the uh, online space. So that's something which is actively managed by the team which is managing this channel. Dave, what about you? If I were to talk about Pepe, so there are multiple formats that we operate in. So even when it comes to e-commerce, there's marketplace, there's our own website. Uh, in the offline, there is the distribution channel, which is quite big for us, but also a large format retail stores and our own EBOs. Now, we have certain guardrails that we want to maintain certain price parity across certain channel of sales, and that we are very stringent on. But there is also the scope, which allows us to be, have online exclusives, that means that we are building a core range of products which gets replenished very frequently and it continues year on year. And that we may have some flexibility for offers. The idea is also what is our core philosophy while we are reaching out to a certain uh, customer base who knows about us, who comes to us, who buys frequently. We are also leveraging and attracting a lot more new consumers online. And there are certain hooks that you have to have in the market to get to them. But we've always seen that customers who are more loyal, buying more frequently, their average order values are much higher, uh, they're buying more full price products. And you know, so, so over the time, I think we've found a balance at our end for sure. Yeah. Sunil? I think uh, mine is, uh, for Lenskart, it is similar to what Vidyut said, that the price parity is, price control is 100% with us. And all the channels will have the same price. What we do is definitely when we have certain merchandise which is available only for online, we can afford to keep the price lower or higher based on the season. But since we are also into lens manufacturing and we, you have to tailor make that particular product for the customer, so the pricing can be played based on the upgrade of the lens what is there. So. For a customer, it doesn't look like there is a, you know, uh, difference in the price at any point because the merchandise is entirely different and that is how we do it. But what is more important is that if you have multiple verticals, working out the unit economics backwards is extremely important. Otherwise, your margins will take a bigger hit because you, if you do a different price parity here. Because my cost of operating an HTO, home try-on, is higher than operating a on offline business. So we have to work backwards also for that. Shell, I want you to answer this in the context because you've got Nika and you've got the stores, right? And uh, Nika, I always feel that even the big brands, you offer a discount. Now what happens over there? Because obviously, you've also got pressure from the brands not to discount but the marketplace discount and how does the physical store react to that? Yeah. 
So actually as Nike, our position has been very clear from day one that we only do discounting which the brands tell us, right? So not even a single penny invested from our side. But coming to the point of how do I manage pricing between online and offline, I actually have an opinion which will be slightly counter to what everybody else here has stated. And it goes back to the fundamental that we are in beauty business where pricing online fluctuates quite a bit. Brands are happy to give an hour-long flash sales from time to time, which for me is impractical when it comes to physical retail, right? Okay. Brands are, would want to do some of the things during weekday for a couple of hours. For physical retail, I do not want to run anything for a couple of hours because I know my footprint will not be wide enough or rather my consumer comes in a different zone, right? In a different time band. She's coming over weekend much more as compared to the weekdays. And, and hence the way pricing and this is where we've now moved away from omni-channel pricing strictly to two cuts. One is for luxury brands, of course, we maintain the pricing because there the, price, the MRP is high enough for consumers to feel the pinch. But when it comes to lower than that, we actually price and this is what we work out with the brands as per the channel. So if the brand wants to do a couple of days of sale, I would say let's do it on a weekend when I have a wider a larger footfall to really draw the leverage off. Online, I might be okay to do it on a Wednesday or a Thursday as well because I can get the consumers whenever I have the pricing over there. Uh, and this also goes down to the fact that online price discovery is immediate. When you open the app, whatever SQ you're looking, you can see the MRP and the slash price. In physical detail, when we've got 5,000 SKUs, to maintain a dynamic pricing on the shelf all the time is not possible. And even though they are beauty advisors, no one is an expert to actually know the price of an SQ, which is fluctuating at any given point of time. So that is where you do what is right for the channel. And that is what we've seen gives us tremendous joy. At the end of the day, customer needs to get the value from both the channels. That value proposition might be different. The value proposition in a physical store might be that she can get a consultation, she can get a free makeover, she can get free gifts, and she can walk away immediately with the products, right? Whereas in online, it's a deferred purchase, it's, it's, it's a lot of layers. And hence, I do not think it's, it's always simplistically about same pricing across the channels. It is about what is right for the channel and for the consumer at the end of the day. NP? As mentioned earlier, we have made our life very simple. If at all we have, by any chance, sometimes we do not discount as mentioned, but if at all we have to run a discount for the tail line to make the space for the new, new launches to happen, then we do it across. If you find a particular product A with 10% discount online, the similar discount will be offered through the retail store as well. At the same time, same period. So we don't create that any point of confusion for the customer to decide where to buy. So that's, that's what we maintain. Okay, so uh, for us, and uh, I have a uh, certain opinion, which is uh, my own opinion. Uh, a, we sell product. We, we don't sell uh, shares so that every hour your prices should go up and come down. So we are into product selling business. At the same time, I personally don't believe in online exclusive product. Why are you, we differentiating our own customer by saying, okay, you buy cheap, so you go online. And if you can afford to buy expensive product, come to our store. So these two strategies, as in flash sale, going, uh, giving some promotion and offer, is probably is not something that currently we relate to. Uh, in fact, uh, if you ask me, as in we don't do it across the channel, be it travel retail, e-commerce, uh, or offline stores. We always ensure that our prices are exactly same, our offers are exactly same all across. That's one. The second thing, I think uh, a lot of uh, uh, mall, mall developers these days are also coming up with their own e-commerce platform. One my friend Rupali is doing, she is smiling there. So she has been uh, 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 trying to do it from a very long time. That is probably another way of ensuring. So how is a, uh, a deal seeker actually trying to find out the price of the product on Google. Now, the moment someone sees that it is available at X price uh, on all across platform, whether this product is available X minus Y percentage at, um, at a marketplace, there's some degree of uh, dissatisfaction also goes to the customer as why 
they are discounting and not every place it is discounting. So we don't want to create that dissatisfaction to the customer and hence we keep a very uh, a good vigil across all marketplace platform that no one should be abusing our product uh, all the time. That's one. Second, you need to be very, very strict with your agreements with these marketplace platform. Otherwise, they have thousands and thousands of rupees to burn on your brand uh, for sure. So these are the two things. And personally, as I mentioned, two things we don't believe at this stage. We might change our thought in future, which is online exclusive product, which is slightly cheaper in comparison to other and flash sales during the week or the weekends. So Abhishek, I'm going to go back to an observation you made little earlier where you said there is an India customer and there is a Bharat customer. The Bharat customer is looking for deals probably, but he's still aspiring to your brand. Yeah. And there's an India customer who loves the brand, is devoted to the brand and comes and buys that brand. Uh, I want to know from the other panelists, do you also believe similarly in your own categories? And secondly, because the digital consumer is relatively a younger consumer and brands like Lacoste, Samsonite, uh, you know, even Pepe, I mean, how do, you use, uh, how do you use digital marketing to get that younger consumer? Do you do something different there? Okay, so first of all, for, at least for I can tell you, for my brand, it is not only the younger customer who are buying online. These are accomplished customer also who don't have time in their life. They are also ordering online because it is getting delivered at their home when they don't have time. When you and me are sitting here, we want some product, we just order and it is there at our gate. We can pick up while going back home. So it is not only the younger clients. What is younger clients buying these days? Something that can be worn more than once or twice in a week is what they are buying. They are buying footwear. So that it can be repeated, they are buying caps, wristband. This is something wherein they are relating themselves, showing their aspiration. They are flashing the brand that they want to wear. So these are the categories youngsters are buying. They aren't buying some expensive 20,000 rupee polo and, and wearing it. These products are being bought by someone who has already accomplished something. So that's one. Second, yes, of course, as in younger customers are very important. Digital marketing is very, very important. In fact, as we speak today, we don't do any traditional marketing. We are completely out of print. We are completely out of TVCs, etc. We are only doing digital marketing that too very focused and to and we are also not burning a lot of money on digital, whereas uh, their customer acquisition cost is increasing day by day. Very focused, targeted, understand the customer, take the help of analytics, whatever is available and then spend your money so that your ROI is, is there. Ask my digital team, they'll tell you the, the pain that they have when they come to me every week as to show. And the only question that I ask is how much is the ROI for the spend that you have done this week? And uh, first Jenny. answer if uh, I want you to answer if you if you also believe that there's an India customer and there's a Bharat customer and the Bharat customer is looking for discounts. See, uh, uh, if I have to explain to you by brand, then it will be better understood by the audience as well as uh, you. See, the Samsonite is very clearly uh, uh, positioned as bridge to luxury in India. Outside India, it is premium. So, uh, therefore, the targeted customers are very well, uh, you know, defined and it's very well spread. It's about 550 stores across the country at the right places in the right vicinity connecting with the target audience so be it through the airport be it through the shopping malls or be it through a proper selective high street we are all there so there's no gap as far as samsonite brand is concerned that there is a very very premium location and we are not there so that has been done because when i started the uh, the first store and now I, I have spent quite a sizable time to ensure that we are there at every such place however once you come to the lower price that becomes american tourista and the third one more brand we have launched called chameleon so that targets to the next level of uh, distribution to ensure the width of the distribution as a company is ensured to reach out to every price segment uh, there the formula works very differently. If at all we have got a place, for example, like Kolhapur, so we'll not be only looking out for a store there because it may not be 
feasible to operate a store. But you become a part of the sh shopping shop there and yet represent the brand and connect with your target audience. And, and that's happening very, very well, very well. It's about 300, 400 uh, lifestyles and uh, shopper stop and all those brand uh, reliance. So they are all helping us to basically reach out to the segment B customers as well and very effectively it is working. So irrespective of whether we are there offline, online, we are there connecting with the customers. So therefore the prices category, by price category if you see, through the respective brand, we are able to connect it through. May not be exactly the Samsonite must be work, working all throughout the nation, every part of the country, not necessarily because my target audience is very clear and we wish to represent that portion only and stop. We don't want to forcefully sell the product to the Kolhapur of the world that if there is a 10, 15, 20 or 100 customers, for them we will not really stretch ourselves to reach out there. Let them come and buy at Pune or maybe, maybe even through the online. But the price parity and the price respect, we just maintain. Shail, the India versus Bharat uh, thing and secondly, you've got Nika Lux and you've got Nika. Is Nika Lux a metro brand and is Nika for everyone? I want you to give me some insight on that. Yeah. So, I believe India consumer, Bharat consumer is definitely a thing. But it's not divided by geography that she's situated in. They, both of them are there pretty much in Mumbai, in Delhi and all of the places, right? Uh, and, and hence what we see is there are consumers who are little more susceptible towards discount who would choose to buy a product or not basis the discount which is there on the product. But given this is CPG, where you don't flash the brand after you've used it, it's the result that it has on you, right? So product fundamentals still rule the, the roost and hence if you've got a fabulous brand which works really well on zero discount as well, it sells. Because there the product is the proof of the pudding, right? Uh, coming to the point about Nika Lux and on trend, that's the format that we call it. Actually, it's not just about metro versus non-metro. It is about depending on the catchment, where's the propensity to buy a little more luxury versus the other. Because in both of the, these formats, Nika Lux is where we do not have mastige brands. It will only primarily have premium and luxury brands. Whereas on trend would have mastige premium and bridge to luxury brands as well. Depending on the catchment, what's the propensity of consumers to buy is where we place it. So even in Mumbai, there are many locations where there is a Nika on trend. And even in a city like Kochi or Guwahati, there are Nika Lux stores, which uh, are doing really well and, and amongst the top stores of the country. So I think it's a, it's a coexisting phenomenon depending on where the consumer. I think uh, for Lenskart, first of all, I think uh, what uh, Abhijit said is also right that Bharat and India, aspirations is there everywhere, right? It is not like Bharat has got less aspiration, they have got aspiration and they have got money also. But there are some people who would like to look at a discounted product or a price value which is higher. But for Lenskart, we actually failed by doing that honestly speaking, like he was saying about Lux. We also had a lens cart light model, wherein we put only Vincent Chase and we did not put the premium John Jacob there. But it terribly failed, honestly, because we underestimated that people will buy only a thousand or thousand five hundred, uh, you know, rupee product, whereas they were aspiring to buy higher. Today with the digital revolution which is there and if you say that aspiring people are available, why not make that available for people to have a choice? Why are we governing what the customer should buy? We are having the choice in a physical as well as in a physical both in retail as well as online, both the brands. Let them select what they want, right? That is what is the approach which we have taken in this aspect. And we have kept the parity of the, uh, you know, price across geographies and like what he said, even in Mumbai there is a Bharat and there is an India. So yeah, here I quite resonate with what Shailendra had to say. You know, so Bharat shoppers or India shoppers are not segregated by geographies. Uh, I'll set some context, I'll try to answer this question a bit differently for Pepe. Hello. So for Pepe, we've been, you know, it's a 50 year plus brand. It's a part of a European fashion house. 
but of that 50 years, we've been present in India for over 30 years. So we are very well established. We have a very strong offline footprint. And we are seeing growth coming from a lot of tier two, tier three cities. We are seeing that a lot of our customers are people who've been shopping with us for a very long time. Uh, a lot of them are 35 plus. We have always been the top two denim brand in the country. But the online part, you know, the demographics are different. What we are seeing is that a good growth is coming from Metro, Tier 1. Uh, shoppers from 18 to 34 are 60% when it comes to online. And also, it's also by design. You know, globally, we are a very strong women's wear brand as well. And in India, that is, you know, we are predominantly men's wear. So we are actually pushing a lot more uh, awareness around women shoppers, trying to recruit them. And that's actually, you know, even today, we've just gone live with our celebrity endorsement, you know, so just to talk about women's wear a lot more. So we are using channels very strategically, trying to recruit a different type of consumers. So that's also our objective. Uh, if you ask me, is there a value seeking consumer? Yes, there is. There's a consumer who is, is there in the value segment and that segment is growing day by day. And the kind of brands and the kind of retail expansion we've seen some of the brands clearly points to the fact that the value retail segment exists. Now, obviously there is no geographical segregation. I mean, the discerning consumer who is seeking value is also seeing the same locality where a luxury seeking consumer is also there. And so that, that sort of coexists. Another phenomena which we have seen come through some of our researchers is that uh, the new Gen Z consumer today is looking at value retail because they are not so overawed by brands. Uh, there is a set of consumers who are looking for the right design and the right price and they are not overawed by a branding being there or they don't want to showcase a brand on, or a logo on that. So that's another trend which we are seeing. So therefore, when I say value seeking doesn't always mean a certain economic strata, it could mean something else also which the consumer is seeking. Okay, I think we've got another six minutes to go. Uh, we've got another six minutes to go and uh, uh, I just like one of one or two of you to take on this question. Uh, how many of you are seeing consumers as brand consumers and how many of you are looking at it as a single view of a customer, which means I'm a Pepe, Samsonite, Lacoste customer, irrespective of where I buy and what are you doing in terms of investment in technology uh, for that? Uh, Maybe uh, Shailendra, you want to put some uh, view and uh, anyone is welcome to take, take on this question. Yeah. So, um, I think any organization would be doing injustice to itself and to the consumer if they are not seeing the consumer in totality. And, and hence, no matter what amount of tech data does it take, to really pull together that end-to-end -end history is super critical. Because that is when you are able to truly solve for the consumer's problem and also get the maximum value as well. Like for instance, today when a consumer browses a foundation and leaves it in the cart online, when she goes to the store and she's at the checkout counter, the cashier there prompts and tells her, ma'am, you have added this foundation, but you've not bought it. Do you want to try the shade out? And by the way, because we are nudging you to promptly buy it, here's a 10% discount from the brand as well for you. Now suddenly the consumer is getting her doubt solved because of course she didn't buy online because foundation is really a challenge category to buy because not knowing what shade exact match will, will happen. And, and the moment you are able to do that in the physical detail, suddenly you have solved for the consumer and you have solved for the value as well which you would have otherwise lost out, right? So ultimately it is about one consumer view. It is also about then making sure the enabling technology is well in place. Like for instance, we all talk about, and yes, today there is technology enough available where you can seamlessly target the consumer online, offline, right? When it is online, it's an easy one because you know her exact phone numbers and all, and you do this. But today in physical detail, I struggle to get an identifier on her when she walks into the store before she goes to the counter. I do not want to create the friction in the journey by asking her phone number when she enters or having her identifier over there. So I wish if there was a technology which could really solve for this problem statement, I think it will be a massive enabler for brands, for a lot of businesses, which can truly revolutionize the way we look at the consumer and, and truly offer them omni-channel. 
Uh, thanks. NP, you can have the last word. We've got another three minutes. I would like to just touch very quickly upon this point. See, the product is a differentiator. The moment you have got a well-thought, innovative product, like what Samsonite does, they come up the first in the world. If somebody has seen the trolley moving upward, that was done by us. The first one to put the wheel on the bag was we. So therefore, once you have a distinctly different product, you don't need much of communication, but yes, of course, you have to connect with your target audience through required medium of advertising or maybe publications or whichever the medium you adopt, but you can reach out there. But you can reach out there more effectively if you have got a differentiator product. That people appreciate and understand it very, very well, very quickly. So that's what exactly happening with us. I would like to add one point what Shalender said just now and uh, how do we really see one view of the customer as, as brand when it comes to service? For example, if I know a customer uh, added something into cart and did not make the purchase, probably I will not say this to the customer when she is at the cash desk. What I will ask probably, ma'am you purchased white polo two months ago, hope it is doing fine. Are you looking for any new colors in the same style? Because this way also I am trying to increase my sale, but I am not trying to embarrass the customer at my cash desk by saying you added in your cart, but you did not make the purchase. That's one. Second, what is that I am doing in order to make the, that uh, added cart product to make the purchase? Again, offering a 10% discount. And this is something that as brand, I think we should be really... Uh, strict enough that we cannot and we should not offer discount because the moment you said you are offering discount you are actually deviating from the point that you just said that your prices are online and offline are same. It means you are creating a distinction by offering a 10% which is a differentiated pricing at the offline store. So as customer point, uh, customer service point of view, yes one single view of customer is right but uh, to make them more and more purchase, I think this is not something that we should be doing as, as brand. Can I, can I Thanks, just clarify yeah. one no, you bit? Go ahead, go ahead. Another uh, 30 seconds you've got. Yeah, yeah, 30 seconds is all I need. Uh, today when we say extend that 10%, it is something which the brands themselves are pushing, both online and offline. Because even online, the way the journeys are built is that if a consumer added to cart, and in beauty, actually it's a very different phenomenon as compared to say a t-shirt or a, a product where it's just about the color. Here it is actually multiple layers of complexities which needs explaining and that is where the conversation of saying, ma'am, you added to the card but you've not been able to make up your mind, can we help you with it? Is the approach and, and that truly works is what you've seen. Uh, thank you, it's been absolutely a pleasure having all of you here and uh, I think each of you are on, uh, at different stages of your product life cycle but uh, all very powerful brands, uh, you shared a lot of good perspective with us. We might have time to take on just two questions because else we run out of time. No, no questions. We've got to meet you outside. <laughs> Can I get this mic? No, no, no. Yeah, sir. But that was really a thought-provoking discussion. Let's give a huge round of applause and Mr. Shetty very well conducted. Pleasure having each and every one here with us and thank you once again for grazing this occasion. Before you leave, we would like to felicitate you and I would again, one more request, Mr. Shetty, you have to do the honor. So please, starting with Mr. Abhishek, you will be felicitating. So I'll just call out the team. Let's give a huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, everyone. And please stay back with us as we have another panel discussion and of course our next keynote speaker. Next, Narendra Pratap. Shailendra Singh. Mr. Menon. Mr. Sinha. And Mr. Bidyut, thank you so much. Yes, how can we how can we leave our moderator? I would request Reema Punya from our conference head Mapic India to please join me on stage to felicitate our moderator. Is Reema here?
All right. So Rima is not here. I would request Abhishek, sir. Abhishek, sir, I would request you to please do the honor and felicitate our moderator. Thank you. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Let's take a picture. Come. Stay back with us, ladies and gentlemen. This is not it. We got something more for you. So let's not miss this. Make the most of this year conference 2024, where we get the best of the best topics for you.